the Marian dogmas. There's four of them, and we'll be discussing each of them as we go through this presentation. But first, let's stop and remind ourselves what a dogma even is. A dogma of the Catholic Church is a revealed truth declared and defined by the Church. It's something that has been believed since the time of the Apostles, given to us by God and passed down in the Church's tradition, you know, refined and developed through her magisterium, her teaching authority, and again, defined and declared as a revealed truth by the Church. So we come to Mary, our mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Who is she and what we know about her ultimately points to her son Jesus. And that is that relationship that we look to throughout these four dogmas. So let's dive deeper into each of these and come to know our mother, what the church teaches and believes about her. The four Marian dogmas. Before we even look at these, each four of them, how should we properly understand Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mother? Let's take a look at that. So understanding Mary properly. Here's a quote from the Catechism that can really help us. What the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ, and what it teaches about Mary illumines, in turn, its faith in Christ. So, what we know of Mary teaches and ultimately points to Jesus, her Son. Catholics do not worship Mary. We give her a special veneration to the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is substantially less than adoration due to God alone. All veneration of Mary is higher than that of the angels and other saints because of her unique closeness but subordination to her son. A fancy Latin word for this, the veneration we give to Mary, is called hyperdulia. So hyper meaning a lot, and dulia meaning honor or, or veneration. So it's not worship, but it is a special veneration because of her closeness to Jesus and her role in salvation that we'll, we'll get to very soon. So St. Louis Grignon de Montfort, a French saint, with a special devotion to Mary, he wrote a book called True Devotion to Mary, has this very simple quote that we can use to help us understand Mary properly. To Jesus through Mary. So we have a special relationship with Mary, again, that helps us come to her son. The four dogmas are, and these are not in any particular order of hierarchy, but just listing them here. Mary, the mother of God, the Immaculate Conception, Mary, Perpetual Virgin, and the Assumption. The first dogma, Mary, Mother of God. You might be very familiar with this if you've heard or attended Mass, that we say uh, this in the Nicene Creed, the, the, the prayer uh, that we say right after the petitions during Mass. So it's the Nicene Creed, and it has in that the line that we talk about Jesus becoming man, incarnate, through Mary. So we profess that in the Creed, that Jesus was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. Mary, the mother of God, is celebrated in the liturgical year, so the church calendar that's different from our, our normal secular calendar, and that's celebrated on January 1st, so New Year's Day. So it's even more important for us as Catholics. It's the solemnity of Mary, the Holy Mother of God. And it's such an important day in our faith uh, that it's a holy day of obligation for Catholics. So we are, we are obligated, we're required to go to Mass to celebrate this special solemnity of Mary. The dogma of Mary, Mother of God, was declared at the Council of Ephesus in the year 431. In that declaration, it's to summarize it, that Jesus is the Son of God who became man. Therefore, Mary is the Mother of God. 
not that he was created or received existence from her, but he, that he was born of her, born of her into flesh. So this is the sacred mystery of the incarnation. One of Mary's many titles, one of the many names we give her, bestow upon her, is Theotokos, which is Greek for Mother of God. So you might hear that word tossed around. It's just her title in Greek, so the ancient, from the ancient tradition, Theotokos, the Mother of God. So let's look at more of that mystery of the Incarnation. So this is how the dogma points to our belief in Jesus, her Son, knowing more about her Son. So the announcement of the birth of Jesus is that moment of Jesus coming into the world through the, his conception in Mary's womb. And so the details of this account in Luke's Gospel are very important. And that Gospel account can be found in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 48. So a lot of Old Testament prophecies are being fulfilled here. So those details are important. Of Mary, the, the virgin, how could it be possible that she is now going to be with child, the, the Savior of the world? Well, in Genesis 16.11 is the announcement to Sarai, who would become Sarah, the wife of Abraham, who is old in age and, and barren, not able to have children. It is told to her that she will have a child, and she has that child, Isaac. And then in Judges, in chapter 13, verse 3, the announcement to a man named Manoah that his wife, who is barren and not able to have children, that she will conceive. And then the great Emmanuel prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, 14, that the Emmanuel, that God is with us, the Savior of the world, will, will come into the world through a young virgin. So how is this possible? Only through God. So these, Jesus is fulfilled. He is the fulfillment of all these Old Testament prophecies of barrenness to conception through Mary, the Virgin. And if we also look at Matthew's Gospel, it compares well with Luke's account. So it's the birth of Jesus announced by the angel of the Lord to Joseph in a dream. But it's still that Jesus will be born, he will be conceived through the Virgin and so Mary truly is the mother of God. So Mary was invited to be the mother of Jesus in Luke chapter 1, 30 to 33. And Jesus was fully God and fully human. So two natures, human and divine, in one person, a divine person of Jesus. Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the child Jesus truly is the Son of God. So it's a work of God that Mary uh, accepts her role as the mother of the Savior. And she truly is the, the, the mother of God because she conceived by the Holy Spirit. So it's a work of God. Now let's look at another scripture account of how scripture points to Mary as the mother of God. And that's from the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1, 39 through 56. Again, the details of Luke's account are very important. They point to the dogma of Mary being the mother of God. So when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So that's right after the announcement of the birth of Jesus by the angel Gabriel to Mary. So how does it point to it, that Mary being the mother of God? Well, John the Baptist, who's in Elizabeth's womb, recognizes the presence of God in the child Jesus in Mary's womb. He knows that this is truly the Son of God. And Elizabeth recognizes this presence of God as well because she knows that, she says, the mother of my Lord should come to me. 
She sees Mary as the mother of God right from that moment. So an important thing here to remember, Mary is a created human person. She did not come before God because she was the mother of Jesus. She became the mother of God when she freely accepted motherhood for Jesus, who was always God, but who took on human flesh at one point in time according to God's plan of salvation. So now let's move to the second dogma that we'll look at, the Immaculate Conception of Mary. So the Immaculate Conception. Now this is not the conception of Jesus. Sometimes that can be easily confused and thought of when we think about this, but it's the Immaculate Conception of Mary. And it's celebrated in the liturgical year on December 8th, the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of Blessed Virgin Mary, again, a holy day of obligation for Catholics. And a cool thing is that this is the patronal feast day for us in the United States. So all of us U.S. Catholics, uh, the Immaculate Conception, she's our patroness. So it should be a, a really special day for us to celebrate too as Catholics in the U.S., that the Immaculate Conception is, is our patroness. This is our feast day. So this dogma was first proclaimed census fidelium, which is Latin for the sense of the faithful. So a, a special understanding by all of the, the people of God that this is a true revealed uh, belief right from the start. So this dogma has always been believed by the church since her beginning. The explanation of it was developed over time and refined by theologians, but the belief was always there. And it's famously uh, debated and refined and developed by the Dominicans and the Franciscans throughout the Middle Ages. Um, there's, there's kind of some noted battles they had talking about the Immaculate Conception and a, uh, a young friar named Dun Scotus kind of seems to be the prevailing theologian during the Middle Ages of you know, upholding the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Now Pope Pius IX in 1854, in one of his apostolic constitutions, so one of his official writings as Pope, called Ineffabilis Deus, the ineffability of God, he spoke infallibly, so without error, from the chair of St. Peter, the first pope, which we call, when he's speaking in that special position, we call it ex cathedra, from the chair. So he declared this, that Mary was immaculately conceived in 1854. Okay, so what does immaculate, immaculately conceived even mean? The Immaculate Conception, so it's God's plan for salvation in Mary's role. So here's a quote from Pope Pius IX in his Apostolic Constitution, Ineffabilis Deus. The most blessed Virgin Mary was, from the first moment of her conception, by singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. So, the Immaculate Conception means Mary had no original sin. She did not receive original sin when she was conceived. She was preserved from that by the work of God. Mary was full of grace. We, we hear about this in Luke 1.28. The angel says, Hail, full of grace. Hail, favored one. So she was full of that grace, having not inherited original sin through her human nature from the moment of her conception. So she was redeemed from original sin by God's grace, and that, that redemption that we receive to cleanse us from original sin happens at baptism, and that grace we call sanctifying grace. So a quote from the Catechism, to become the mother of the Savior, Mary was enriched by God with gifts appropriate to such a role. So God saw fit that if he was going to bring his son into the world, the son of God, 
he needed to prepare a worthy dwelling place. So he enriched Mary through the merits of her, his son, Jesus, to prepare Mary, preserving her from original sin. Mary's predestination by God to be the mother of the Savior did not mean she was without freedom in consenting to God's will. She did freely accept her role in God's plan for salvation. That is her famous fiat, which is Latin for may it be done. When she tells the angel Gabriel, I am the handmaid of the Lord, may it be done according to your word that I become the mother of God. So let's look a little bit closer now at the theological importance of the Immaculate Conception. So let's go back to our salvation history here. God created man and woman, Adam and Eve, in his image and likeness in Genesis chapter 1. We know that. But they chose to sin. We find that in Genesis chapter 3. And we call this first sin the fall. And from that fall, that first disobedience, original sin entered the world through human nature. So that original sin again, a review here, is our inclination to sin. It's a, a disordered desire within us to sin, to disobey God. All are born with original sin because of our fallen human nature. If Mary had original sin, she would have passed on original sin to Jesus through the human nature he took on from Mary as his mother. Now, since God has no sin in him, this is not possible. Mary was preserved from original sin by God so that when the Son was sent into the world, he would have a worthy, pure dwelling place. As we mentioned before, it's part of God's enriching Mary with this fullness of grace so that Jesus could become man. And we can think of Mary's womb as that tabernacle, that worthy, pure dwelling place, the tabernacle of, of holding Jesus. It even has some kind of Eucharistic themes here. Christ sanctifies Mary because he's the Son of God. It's not the other way around that because Mary is full of grace, she's immaculately conceived, that she sanctified Christ. No, it's always Mary's made worthy by the merits of her son. By the grace of God, Mary remained free of every personal sin her whole life long. It's from the Catechism. So Mary had human free will, but she cooperated fully with God's grace through her life and did not sin. We'll now look at the third dogma, Mary the Perpetual Virgin. Mary's perpetual virginity, what does that mean? Simply put, she was, is, and always will be a virgin. She is ever virgin, perpetually a virgin. So this was, like the Immaculate Conception, first proclaimed sensus fidelium, the sense of the faithful. So the church confessed from the beginning that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Defended by the Council of Lateran in 649, Mary's perpetual virginity was upheld. So, Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit without human seed. There was no human interaction here. It was a pure, absolute work of God. The Gospel accounts understand the virginal conception of Jesus as a divine work that surpasses all human understanding and possibility. A quote there from the Catechism and we'll look at a, a few scripture references here that show that. The scriptural data, if you would. So in Luke 1.35, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That's the angel Gabriel speaking to Mary of how it will be, be possible that her as a virgin, having not known a man, to conceive. Then in the other infancy narrative account in Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 and 20. But before they lived together, so with Joseph, her espoused, her fiancé, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. And then, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. And these are coming to Joseph in a dream. 
an angel of the Lord speaking to him. So although these are different narratives, both gospel accounts confirm the virginal conception of Jesus to Mary by the Holy Spirit, the absolute work of God. And this virginal conception, again, we, we mentioned this already as we talked about Mary, the mother of God, is a fulfillment of the Emmanuel prophecy in the prophet Isaiah chapter 7, 14, to a virgin. Now the Hebrew word here, so a little scripture study, is Alma, which we can understand as a young woman of married age, married age. So, but in the Hebrew context here, that would be a virgin. And when it was translated to the Greek, the Old Testament into the Greek, the word they used was Parthenos. And they made that interpretation strictly as understanding Alma, the Hebrew word, as virgin. So that's how we get the whole English translation of Mary being a virgin from the Hebrew. So there's that consistency in the interpretation and understanding of the prophecy there. Now, you might say, what about some objections to Mary, the perpetual virgin? What about those Bible mentionings of Jesus' brothers and sisters? Some of those references we have listed here, Mark 3, 31-35, when Jesus' family shows up to speak to him. You know, they, they come to Jesus saying, hey, your mother, your, your, your brothers, your sisters are here, they want to see you. And Jesus famously says, well, my mother, my brothers and sisters are those that hear the word of God and act on it. And then there's some other references, Mark 6, 1 Corinthians, and Galatians chapter 1. Now, all these mentions of brothers and sisters of the Lord, the church has always believed and taught that these passages do not refer to the other children of the Virgin Mary. So, here's an example explanation. James and Joseph, these are the brothers of Jesus that are mentioned in Matthew chapter 13, 55. James and Joseph, the brothers of Jesus, are the sons of another disciple of Christ called Mary, whom Matthew, the gospel writer, significantly calls the other Mary in his gospel. So there's, there's more than one reference to this other Mary. Matthew 28, and also a reference in Matthew 27, 56. So these brothers and sisters of Jesus are close relatives of Jesus, thinking of them as kin, kindred, kinsmen of the same extended family, according to that Old Testament expression of, of kin, kindred, kinsmen. And you can find those references in Genesis 13, verse 8, and Genesis 14, verse 16. And it follows the Hebrew and Semitic linguistic and cultural context of the time. It's always important to get back into the right context of the scriptures when we're dealing with these interpretations, how we understand the people of that era, what they really meant when they said these words. So what's the theological importance here? Why does the virginal conception of Jesus matter? There's five reasons here, and we're going to just list them simply. They're all referenced in the Catechism. First, Mary's virginity manifests God's absolute initiative in the Incarnation. Second, born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit, Jesus is the new Adam. So, the first adding, Adam being created by God on earth, Jesus, the new Adam, is from heaven. So, because he's from heaven, he inaugurates this new creation of the world in the Holy Spirit. Third, by his virginal conception, Jesus ushers in a new birth of children adopted by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's a good thing, because we all are baptismally adopted into God's family to be sons and daughters of God the Father through the Holy Spirit. Mary's virginity, number four, is a sign of her faith. So her virginity is her undivided gift of self to do God's will. Fifth, Mary, the virgin and mother, 
is a symbol of the perfect realization of the church to remain pure in faith and life-giving through her sacraments, through baptism. The church for us is a virgin and mother. The last dogma, the Assumption of Mary. The Assumption of Mary is Mary being taken up into heaven, body and soul. Now that's very important. It's not just her soul, it's not just her body, it's her whole person, body and soul. We are a person because we have a soul and because we have a body. So this Assumption is celebrated in the liturgical year on August 15th, the Solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Again, it's a holy day of obligation for Catholics, so Catholics love to celebrate. We love to celebrate our mother. What better way to do it than go to Mass? The Assumption was declared a dogma by, by Pope Pius XII on November 1st, All Saints Day, in 1950, in his Apostolic Constitution, again, an official document from the Pope, called, oh boy, Munificent Tessimus Deus. It's a tough one to say there. So the magnificence of God. Finally, this is a quote from Pope Pius XII in his document on the Assumption. Finally, the Immaculate Conception, preserved free from all stain of original sin, when the course of her earthly life was finished, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory, and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things, so that she might be more fully conformed to her Son, the Lord of Lords, and conqueror of sin and death. So again, Mary taken up body and soul to heaven by the power of God. Now the assumption of Mary is a singular participation, so a sharing in the resurrection of her Son, and it anticipates helps us to look forward to the future resurrection of all Christians. Now, there are two traditions regarding the Assumption, the Eastern and the Western traditions. So, the Eastern Church, who are, have a different ritual rite and, and some different customs and practices, but they're fully Catholic, they're, they're under the Pope, and then there's the Western, or what we'd call the Latin rite of the Church, and they're traditional understanding of the Assumption. So we're going to look at these two. They can be en enriching for us to understand the Assumption and perhaps they can open us up to uh, understanding it more fully. So the Eastern tradition is the Dormition of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Dormition meaning falling asleep. So the Eastern tradition holds that Mary did not die that because of death is a consequence of original sin. Since Mary was immaculately conceived, so preserved from original sin, she did not suffer death. It's kind of logical there. The Western tradition, Mary died, but her body was preserved from corruption. So at the time of her death, Mary did not suffer the separation of body and soul, nor the deterioration of her body. So, here's the important thing. Regardless of theological understanding here, the Eastern and Western traditions, the dogma of the Assumption is upheld for both. So, at the end of her earthly life, the Blessed Virgin Mary was assumed into heaven, body and soul. So whether it was her dormition, her falling asleep, or, or she actually did die and her body was preserved from corruption, regardless, she was taken up into heaven, body and soul both hold this it's the one Catholic belief. So Mary remains a sign and icon of the promise of eternal life and the hope of the bride, which is the church, to be united with her heavenly spouse, Jesus Christ. So there are the four dogmas. We explained them, we explored them, their theological importance, references to them in the scriptures, the official declarations by the Pope, catechism references, but let's just look at them, all four of them, and simply state them as a review and good reminder for us. Mary, the Mother of God. This dogma is Jesus is the Son of God who became man, 
Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. The Immaculate Conception. From the first moment of her conception, Mary was preserved from original sin. Mary, perpetual virgin. Mary was, is, and always will be a virgin, having conceived the child Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. The dogma of the Assumption, when the course of her earthly life was finished, Mary was taken up, body and soul, into heavenly glory. So let's end here with a, a final slide on how we can have a relationship to Mary, how we can cry out to her, Hail Mary, pray for us sinners. So a relationship to Mary is a relationship to a queen and mother. That's how we can look at it and understand it and live it. So a queen, how is Mary a queen for us? We know she was assumed into heaven, so she's in heaven. Jesus crowned her the queen of heaven. So as queen, she protects us from sin and evil. As a mother, as being the mother of God, she's our mother too. We look at John's gospel and Jesus gives her to us when he's on the cross. Behold your, your son. So as a mother, she intercedes for us to help us grow in holiness. She's praying for us to grow in virtue. And we can ask her to pray for our needs, our petitions, to pray for other people. She's a good mother. She wants to care for us because she loves us as she loves her son. Now a devotion to the rosary and Marian memorials, feasts, and these solemnities that we mentioned help to foster this relationship to Mary and it strengthens our belief in what the church teaches about her. So what we pray, we believe. Again, let's just review two things from the start. We don't worship Mary. What the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ. And what it teaches about Mary illumines in turn its faith in Christ. That very important, uh, I think, but very short saying from St. Louis to Jesus through Mary. And remember, you can never love Mary more than Jesus. And if you think you're going down that road, Mary would not want this and she will direct you to know her son more deeply. These four Marian dogmas, how a precious treasure they are for the church, for our belief in our Blessed Mother and what they teach us about her Son, our Lord Jesus. So just an encouragement, an invitation to perhaps study these further, perhaps you know, develop that relationship to Mary as we, as we just talked about, as Queen, as Mother, all things that we know of her point to her Son. And that great prayer, that simple prayer, the Hail Mary. So let's pray that together now, asking for Mary's intercession to always know her and to know her Son, and cherish what the church has about her in these four dogmas. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless.